Well, hi there, everyone. My name is Carol Lutzinger, and I'm spending time with you today to talk about science things. You may remember me from coming to different classrooms and talking about science and having adventures with you. And uh, we decided we would try doing something on KBSD. So welcome to the show. And since it's about science and science is cool, we wanted you to think about what a scientist is. And I suspect that in your brain, you have an image of a scientist. So we would like for you to draw a picture of a scientist, however you want to draw it. And ask your parent or a teacher to send it to us at KBSD TV. And we'll take a look at your pictures and we may even share some of them on a later program. I suspect that most of you think a scientist wears a white coat. Who can be a scientist? And what do scientists do? In our first picture that we're sharing with you, <laughs> there's a mountain on the back of the picture and there's two people hanging from a rope and a boat. And they're going down the side of a cliff. And they're going into something called a sinkhole. A sinkhole is a formation where part of the earth has just sunken into the ground. It's literally a sunken hole. And those scientists are two different people. One is an ecologist named Mick Brand, and the other is a meteorologist, Kostian Swart, from James Cook University in Townsville, Australia. They're lowering a boat into a 50 yards deep sinkhole in Arnhem Land, Australia, to investigate the area's geological record. That's half of a football field down into the ground. Ecologists are scientists who work with the living and non-living things in an environment. There are many different kinds of ecological work. Meteorologists you're familiar with. You see them on the TV nightly weather reports. They study the climate, the atmospheres, and the weather of regions. And here's another image of a different sinkhole. And you can see the layers of the rock in this picture, and each layer models thousands of years of putting down sediment. And I know that you've been studying sediment in some of your science classes. And look at all those layers, and that's just a low area of the earth. And down at the bottom of that sinkhole is water because under the rocks of our planet, there is lots of water. Now this picture is one of my favorites, and I guess you can think about why. Um, <laughs> the night sky, and I really like astronomy. Down in the lower left right hand corner of this image is one lonesome scientist. This is a geodesist. Her name is Hang Li, and she's from China's Wuhan University in Hubei, China. She lived alone all by herself in the Antarctic at the Chinese science station in total darkness for two months. And it was so cold you could freeze in minutes without warm enough clothing to wear. I wouldn't want to go there. A geodesist is someone who measures and monitors the earth to determine the exact coordinates of any point. And you've studied coordinates if you're in the fifth grade. Um, those are those lines of latitude and longitude on the map. They are scientists who use satellite images and on the ground surveys to put together a complete picture of the world's measurements. This is an image of the globe with those measurements drawn onto it. And if you see the line down the middle, that's zero degrees, that's the starting point. And of course, Earth doesn't have that painted on itself. This is something that math people did. And they did it to help us understand how things work on our planet. Each line represents 15 degrees. And if you're in the fourth or fifth grade, you've used a protractor to measure circles. And you remember those degrees that are marked on there? If you look at this picture closely, you can just imagine your protractor put over the top of that and think about the degrees that are marked on there. All the time, the Earth is rotating on its axis moving from west to east. 
and it moves 15 degrees of the, like those lines on the map every hour. And so it looks to you and me like the sun walks across the sky all day long from morning until night forever and ever. In the middle horizontally is our equator and that's another zero degree mark. We'll talk more about these kinds of things on another show. Now <laughs> that is a very large turtle. And the young lady who is down on the dirt by her is a marine biologist, Callie Vilnturf. She's interested in sea turtles. She works out of Olima, California, but in the picture, she's in South America, measuring temperature and pH and some other things and collecting data to protect the leatherback turtles as they lay their eggs on beaches in South and Central America. She and her colleagues told me that they ate powdered baby food for breakfast every day for five months while they were doing their work. Because the work was so important, there was no time to have anything else for breakfast than powdered baby food. Do you know what kind of sea turtles nest down South Padre Island in Boca Chica Beach? This is a picture of two of the biologists who work with the Ridley Turtle Program out there, and I just gave away the answer. Maybe you'll remember that because we're going to be asking you some questions that you can submit your answers and responses to us at KBSD and maybe win a little prize or something. So let's, let's think about what we have locally because sea turtles are an endangered species and they come to our Boca Chica Beach and South Padre Island every year to lay their eggs. And during the summer, those eggs hatch. And sometimes you can go down to the beach and watch them release those little turtle babies back into the Gulf of Mexico. Ethiopia is a place you may never have heard of. And when I look at this photograph, it makes me feel like I'm on a strange, different, totally different planet than Earth. But this is planet Earth. And all of those structures in that picture are salt that the water has evaporated from and left those piles behind. The scientists who are studying these are microbiologist Hugo Moores and geologist Mika de Crane who work taking samples from the volcanic salt plains in northern Ethiopia, one of the most extreme environments on Earth. If they find living organisms in there, and they do, these organisms are called extremophiles, and they're fun to think about, and you can do some research for those. Water there at that particular place in Ethiopia is seven to 10 times saltier than the sea. If you've ever been to the beach and swallowed beach water, you know it tastes salty. Imagine seven to 10 times more salty than that. It's more acidic than many car batteries. And if the acid gets on you, it burns your skin and makes holes in your clothes. So we've got a couple of pictures of, of acid. And this is, you might have seen this on your family's vehicle. Battery acid reacts and then your car doesn't start. Microbiologists study microscopic organisms such as viruses, like we've been battling here in our, in our world right now, bacteria, fungi, algae, and sometimes parasites. Geologists, on the other hand, study the states of matter on Earth. And I know some of you are studying the states of matter. Think about what those are and then connect it to what the geologist is doing. Studying states of matter and, uh, on Earth and other planets. They also study the processes that shape those solar system bodies. Oh boy, we go from Ethiopia where it's hotter than you can think of to where it's colder than anywhere else on Earth. These are interning scientists and they're working to extract an ice core sample near McMurdo Station in Antarctica. The sun is so blindingly bright reflecting off of that snow that it's difficult to take good photographs and it's colder there than any other place on Earth. If we go back to the picture, I want you to notice how every single part of them is protected from the cold and sunlight. They're using a drill to core down into the ice, and the ice is very, very thick. 
their faces are covered, their heads are covered, their hands are covered. Every part of them that could be exposed to the cold is covered. And the reason they're wearing those dark glasses on their face, which you can't see, but I know are on them, is because the sunlight is so bright, if they're exposed to it, they go snow blind. And that means for, for a while, they can't see a thing. And so they wear all sorts of protective gear and they core down into the ice and then they pull out something that looks like this. This is an ore, a core sample drilled from the ice and it's about a meter long. And if you look carefully at this picture, you can see stripes in it. Dark ones, light ones, gray ones. Each one of those layers has happened at a different time in history. This is probably a two to three hundred year old ice layer. And when they drill it out and they take it to the laboratories, uh, this is in a tent there in Antarctica where it's cold, there's no heat in there. And the scientists study it. They measure snowfall, they measure volcanic ash drift, and that's what that black layer is. There, there have been quite a few recent volcanic eruptions over the last couple hundred years. And those are all recorded in that ice sample from Antarctica at the bottom of planet Earth. Staying in Antarctica, these two scientists are in a little rubber dinghy out in the middle of <laughs> the ocean, and you can see the piles of ice behind them, and you'll never guess what they're doing. They're chasing a whale, and they're using a crossbow to shoot an arrow into the whale it doesn't kill it and it really doesn't hurt it. At least no whale has complained yet. And what they're doing is taking a sample, just like they took a core sample of ice, they've taken a core sample of blubber and skin to track the health of the whale population. These two people are marine biologists. Greg Larson from Duke University in North Carolina and Ross Nichols of the University of California who are chasing a minke whale in the Antarctic waters, using that crossbow to get that sample of blubber and skin. And if you look at the picture, you can see that they've measured it with centimeters. So it's very important that at school you learn how to use the metric system because science uses the metric system. It's across the whole world. Everybody uses the metric system in science. And if you read the tape, it tells you when it was collected in 2003 and who collected it and where they collected it. So this would be a kind of an interesting job to do. How would you like to go get a sample of blubber and skin from a whale? Now this may look like a scene on the way to Boca Chica Beach or on the way to South Padre Island when people take their four wheel drives out there in the mud flats and see who could get through them without getting stuck. This is an ecologist, and she, it's a lady, and she has been trekking through a swampy area, and boy, is she mired down. You never think about a scientist wearing shorts and getting stuck in the mud, do you? Being an ecologist sometimes means getting stuck in the mud in the wetlands. An ecologist studies nature, plants and animals, and how these organisms interact with one another and the components of their environment. They work to preserve and protect species and ecosystems and solve environmental issues. This is Ashley McMahon and she works in Australia. Another interesting, exciting place to be a scientist. And they're not wearing a lab coat and they're not working in a lab. Scientists have big adventures all over the place. This is a special scientist. Look at the terrain that she's on, on the top of a mountain, looking down into a valley, and you think about those science terms that you'll be studying in the fifth grade in particular. This is another ecologist, Hei Young Ryu, from New York Stony Brook University. And you might have noticed that she was holding a long metal bar with crossbars on it. That was a radio receiver signal, signal receiver and she's using those signals to keep track of ground squirrels in Gothic Mountain, Colorado, above the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory. Those little ground squirrels are wearing a transmitter and as they scurry about in the mountains, 
she's using that receiver to get the signals that are being sent from that collar that the ground squirrel is wearing so they know how the population is getting along. And our last scientist is one who is known around the entire globe. Her name is Jane Goodall, and Jane Goodall is in her 90s now, but this is a picture taken of her probably when she was about 30. And that little chimpanzee that's sitting with its back to her is one of her favorite things in the whole world, chimpanzees. For all of her life, Jane Goodall has been studying how chimpanzees live in the wild since 1965 in the country of Tanzania. Her work made people all over the world appreciate these amazing creatures, the chimpanzee. And this is a recent picture of Dr. Jane Goodall walking in her forest in Tanzania and contemplating what a difference one person can make. And you can be that one person making a difference for our world as well. Thanks for watching.